All right. Now, can you see the screen? Uh, that's is it the right thing? Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad I did it. So this, this computer did have Zoom on it, so I was making sure it all worked right while I did that. So thank you for that lovely introduction, Star. Um, so our talk today is going to be on the Italian Renaissance. Uh, I titled it the Renaissance Revolution, Rediscovering Humanism and Perspective, because these are two major driving factors in the Italian Renaissance. And I think they're really interesting uh, ways that we can approach the art and the history from this period. Renaissance, if the word down in the brown below, you do not have to ever memorize this. I just think it's a fun fact. It is Renascimento, and that means rebirth in Italian. And art historians gave this period uh, the name of Renaissance in English because it, they feel that it was like humanity woke up. We had had these, the quote unquote dark ages uh, of the medieval period, which if you wanna make any medievalist like myself angry, call the middle ages, the dark ages. In fact, they were not. I had a whole lecture that I've done on it. Um, at my college that I teach at, but in fact, it was just different. It was a different time in history where certain things like realism, like narrative, like motion were prioritized in art and to 19th century art historians, that wasn't as good. And so art historians started to call this a rebirth because they see these classical ideas coming back into art and history. And therefore this period was in their opinion, better. Now I could probably spend a whole lecture on how that's wrong, but I'm not going to bore y'all today with the with my crazy you know rants about the Middle Ages. And it happened for four main reasons that we see develop in this period. And I'll go into each one separately. This is just like the screen show the list. Um, so that was the fall of Constantinople. You might know that today as Istanbul. Archaeology, the advent of the printing press, and the development of humanism itself. So the fall of Constantinople is one of those catalyst moments in history. So when the Roman Empire in the West, centered in the city of Rome in Italy, fell in 476, the eastern half of the empire decided to kind of flourish in its own way. And so we actually see Eastern Romans, who refer to themselves as Romans, based in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, Turkey, uh, flourish and survive. I mean, they had their ups and downs, just like any empire. But... In 1453, they were still Roman, they were still around. And that is until the Ottoman Turks came in and decided, well, this is a really great piece of land that we have. It's centered right on the gateway between the East and West and we want it. So on May 29th, 1453, the Ottoman Turks invaded the city of Constantinople. The Roman forces were completely overwhelmed and were decimated. And that is why Istanbul has a new name today and that it is still a primarily Muslim city, um, even now in 2023. A lot of these scholars that had fled the West and then their tradition stayed in Istanbul, Constantinople, fled back over to Italy, to Greece, because they didn't want to live in a primarily Muslim area as Christians. And so they came back bringing all of this quote unquote lost knowledge from ancient Greece and Rome with them. And the church had really suppressed that in the way of, you know, this isn't what the church is teaching. So we're not, we're kind of just trying to ignore it, push it to the side, let it collect some dust on the shelves. And Hi, Kingston. <laughs> and, um, we're going to focus on what Christ is teaching. So all of a sudden we have ancient texts like Ovid's Metamorphosis or Virgil's Aeneid coming back into the public consciousness and artists and writers and scholars and even some of the, the wealthy nobles that could read were like, oh, this stuff's kind of kind of cool. Maybe we should start like studying it and learning about it again and bring it back into our art. We also see a rise in archaeology, and this is not archaeology like Indiana Jones, where they like using the cute little brushes or uh, making everything gridded off so you know exactly where an object was found. This was like a farmer who decided he needed to expand his vineyard for his for his wine grapes, and he discovers statues like this one. This is the Laocoon and his son's group. It is uh, a Roman copy of an ancient Greek bronze original. It dates right around 300 for the original composition, 300 uh, BCE, excuse me, 300 years before the birth of Christ. And it was found in this farmer's vineyard, just buried in the dirt. And he realized quite quickly that this is important. This thing is huge. It's probably like nine feet tall, I think, and about six, seven feet wide. So it is, it is a big piece of marble. So he called the Pope, who was a ruler at the time, and said, found this giant thing in my yard, and it looks kind of important. So can I like, can you send someone out? So he sent, the Pope sent his good friend, artist Michelangelo, to the vineyard and they dug it out and it's now in the Vatican where it remains to this day. When they saw this art, they went nuts. Artists were so amazed 
by the, the contortion and the movement in the body, the, the raw motion on the figure's faces. And when you compare it to art that had been popular before this, where things were very flat, two-dimensional, emotion wasn't really captured um, because those weren't the things that were important to medieval artists. This was a huge shift. And to this day, there are many artists even in the contemporary world that cite this as an important work that inspired them. Um, it's a Greek story from the Trojan War. You might've heard of the Trojan Horse, kind of a big deal. Laocoon warned the uh, warned the Trojans not to take the, the Greeks bearing gifts. He's the one that said that. And Athena sent some snakes to devour him and his sons because she was on the Greek side. It's a terrible story, but it's a really cool piece of art. So that's that applies to a lot of art history. It's a terrible story, but man, is the art good. Next, we have the printing press. Um, this is really important for the development of Western art and culture. It was uh, invented by Johannes Gutenberg of Germany, or what we now would call Germany, in 1436. You have to remember the West had just discovered this. We have evidence of printing presses with very similar technology in China and Korea around the ninth century, so about 500 years before this, but they they like to claim that they did it first. Um, so what Johannes Gutenberg figured out is a system what we call movable print type. And we actually have um, printers that still use that up until very recently. My grandfather was a printer for the Everett Herald. And when he first started off in, I think the mid sixties when he started working there, they were still using this movable print type because they didn't have digital. So you think about it, that's 500-ish years after they started using it actively in Europe and my grandpa was still doing it. Um, and basically you just had cast letters from metal cast of every letter in the alphabet and you would, could arrange them in sentences and you would lay uh, ink across it, put a piece of paper down, and poof, that's the sound it makes, I promise. It's very technical. Um, and you'd have your sentence and then you'd realign all the sentences and you'd go down through and make the document. This was so much faster than what people were doing before. Originally we had monks working in what we call a scriptorium and this is in a monastery. It's a dedicated room. Think of it like your home office and the monks would sit there by candlelight and copy every letter in beautiful Latin calligraphy. If you think of like a medieval illuminated manuscript, those took 15, 20 years to make. All of a sudden you can spend one day and get 50 copies of the same text how like the, the time is just amazing and so you could disseminate all of these ideas not just um like informational pamphlets there's some that survive of like hey there's we've got an excess of this we're going to put it on sale like your coupons in the, in the newspaper today uh martin luther who founded the protestant reformation he used this to disseminate his 95 theses spreading the idea of protestantism around so all of a sudden it's like we went from snail mail to tweets right you can takes a while for a letter to get there, but then you have a tweet, you can send that instantaneously and get that across to your, to your friends, to your family, and to your village. And so we have these ideas that are being rediscovered um, in the, from the Greeks and the Romans, all the classical literature, as well as humanism ideas that are being printed on this paper and sent around Western Europe faster than any ideas really could have been sent before. This is a very long definition of humanism. It's from the Oxford Dictionary, but Essentially what it breaks down to is, instead of focusing 100% on the divine, right? Uh, the medieval period is very religious, right? We're very focused on Christianity. People start to look inwards at themselves. What are humans capable of? What are we as a people capable of? Um, what is our value in society? What can we do to better ourselves and others aside from any religious ideas? Right. This is not like, oh, if I do good for my community, I'm going to go to heaven or I'm going to spend less time in purgatory. Instead, it's I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for my friends, for my family. And this took Europe by storm. Like all of a sudden you've had, had hundreds of years of the church going over everything. But then people start to think a little bit about themselves. And it is not in a selfish way. It, it's in a I'm an individual kind of way and I should be able to kind of come up with how I can impact my own life, the life of my friends, the life of my community, and, and what can I do while I'm here on earth. It, it's and it pulls away a little bit from the church in the sense of like, how can I help solve the problems? And I don't necessarily have to turn to God. So it's like the little seeds we start to see being sprinkled of the Protestant Reformation coming from these ideas of humanism and uh, for example, it led Martin Luther, when one of his 95 theses is, well, we don't need a confession, or we don't need priests, because we have, it can be a person and their own relationship with God versus having some kind of intercessor, some kind of middleman. Um, 
to help us. And so again, that's based in humanism. And we see this permeate through art in the period we call the Renaissance. Now I'm just gonna talk about the Italian Renaissance today. There is a uh, Renaissance up in uh, Northern Europe or what they call, so Germany, uh, parts of France, England, we're just gonna stick with Italy. I've only got, so see if I can do it. There are three periods of the Renaissance, the early, the high, and the late slash mannerist period. I think it's funny that they went with high Renaissance and not middle Renaissance because high Renaissance just sounds way cooler, I think. So I always make that joke when I'm teaching it. It's like, yeah, they didn't want to say the middle Renaissance. Um, so we're going to start off with the early Renaissance, right? Go chronological. The art historians who came up with this, I always joke, were like not creative because Quattrocento just means 1400s in Italy and it primarily took place in the 1400s. Like they didn't give it a full name. Um, we have several artists, I listed some of them on the screen of Masaccio, Donatello, Ghiberti, and Fra Angelico. I'm only going to talk about a couple of them today, but they're just some fun names that you can look up. They're really interesting. They're kind of those first people that are taking these ideas of humanism and of ancient Greece and Rome and kind of starting to express it in their art. It's primarily going to be focused in Florence. We see it start in Rome in the High Renaissance, but Florence was really that main hub because Florence was one of the first city-states in uh, Italy to have a middle class. And it was all thanks to wool. Wool was made, used to make everything back then. And so we have a lot of wool, wool merchants. That was said, though, that word's backwards. Wool merchants living and working in Italy, primarily in Florence, because it was a center for trade. And so the middle class suddenly could afford art. Therefore, we see art develop. The first guy I'm going to talk about has this extremely long name. He is known as Masaccio, which... Uh, is Maso is sort of uh, like the end of Thomas in English. And <laughs> it basically means clumsy Thomas. So I feel kind of bad for him that that's the name he's known by for all of history. It's clumsy Thomas. I mean, it's better. Like Charlemagne's dad was Pepin the Fat. So it really could be a lot worse. But clumsy Thomas is not, not high on my list of cool historical nicknames. He died very young in the plague, which is a super bummer because he was one of the first to use a couple of different techniques that we see pop up in Florence. So I wish we could see what he would have done had he lived longer. But unfortunately, the plague is still a thing, so it got him. This is his most famous work. It's called The Holy Trinity, and it was painted for the Church of Santa Maria Novella. You can actually walk into this church and see it today. Now they have like little ropes off so you can't get super close to it, but it's still on the wall there. It's a fresco painting. He painted it right before he died. This is a very layered, impactful, like multiple meaning work. Art historians like go gaga over it because there's so many different things that he does. So in the bottom third, kind of on the architectural side, there's a skeleton laying on the tomb. And this is an actual tomb. It's like a painted to look three-dimensional tomb. And above the skeleton in Latin, it says, um, what I am now, you will be soon, essentially. So it's basically reminding people that like you die. Like, sorry about it, but it's come back to life. And these are what we call memento mori statements. It's a remember death. And this was a big thing in humanism of remember, we're all only here for a little while. So make the biggest impact that you can. So this served as a reminder to the people wandering through the church of like, hey, your time here is short. Do your best to be a good person. In the next part of it, we have two people. On the left is a man and on the right is a woman. Uh, they're a married couple. We don't know their names. Um, their records have been lost, but they're the ones who commissioned the portrait. So this is what we call a donor portrait um, for people to paint themselves into works of holy figures so that forever their images will be linked with holiness. It might help them if they're not able to be in church, well, at least their likeness is in church. We have a crucifixion scene, so Christ on the cross. Next to him is Mary, his mother, and St. John, who is his favorite disciple, watching the crucifixion happen and kind of pointing it out, like Mary is pointing at it, saying, this is what my son did for you. He has uh, sacrificed himself for your sins. But the remarkable thing comes behind Christ, and that is God the Father. Up until this point, we have no images of God being painted into paintings. He's either shown in the guise of the Holy Spirit, so like a little dove in the background, my favorite, though, is in the Byzantine tradition, it's a hand coming out of clouds, just like a little hand, like, ooh, God here. Um, but this is the first time we see a full figural representation of God. For some, this was very controversial. We actually have records written saying, like, if you broke the commandment of, of false idols because you're not supposed to show God. And others were excited because God looks like a man. 
God looks like us. You know, he looks as as any old man you see passing you in the street. And that, that makes the human and the divine meet each other. And this is such a big part of humanism of just trying to separate the ideas that the divine is so far away and you could just be a good person and be almost divine yourself. So the fact that Masaccio had the courage to paint God in a church, it, it just blew people's mind of 15th century Florence. Um, one of the biggest things that he did in this work that uh, scholars love is he created a vanishing point. I asked my students this this week, like they're all BFA students of, well, how many of you use vanishing points? My whole class raised their hands. and They're like, we hate them. So I'm like, well, you can hate Masaccio because Clumsy Tom made it up. And basically what it is for us non-artists, it's a point in the painting that all the lines converge upon. And this is how you create a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. So if, if I had the wall right here and I was painting a fresco for our gallery, I would make the vanishing point and make sure that all my lines, the invisible lines of painting would come back to it. And you can see the effect that it has where mm -hmm. it makes that architectural feature, uh, it's called a barrel vault, it's just a circle vault, go back farther as if you're walking, the wall is continuously going down, but it's actually just a flat space, you know, like that. If you go, I've been to the church and it actually does look like you could just walk into the painting. It's so hard to see on PowerPoint, but if you're at the church itself, it really does look like you could pass Christ and just keep walking down the hallway. It's fantastic. Um, I wanted to compare it to a crucifixion scene from the Middle Ages, it's from the early Christian era, where there is a little bit of an attempt at three-dimensionality, right? We've got the hill of Golgotha in the background, but everybody's really flat, right? There's no dimensional surfaces. Uh, the sun and the moon are at the top, and that was a representation of God watching over the crucifixion scene. Again, we don't have God as human. And so things have come a long way in 900 years of just showing how... Uh, the, the scene of the crucifixion was depicted. I love this work. I'm obsessed with it. Uh, this is another one by Masaccio. It's in a different church in Florence, Santa Maria del Carmine. Uh, this is the expulsion from the garden. And so essentially what's happening in this painting is Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree of life and the angel was like, that was the one rule, the one rule, and you couldn't even do it. And then they kicked them out. Look how sad. Look at this raw emotion, this wailing. She's embarrassed, right? She's covering her nudity because before they ate from the tree of life, there was no concept of nudity. They were just chilling, right? They, they didn't need clothes because they didn't know clothes existed. And, and once all of this forbidden knowledge entered their brains, they were ashamed. And just look at how raw and, and sad their bodies are hunched over. Uh, Eve almost seems to be wailing up at the angel, like, why did I do this? Why did I tempt Adam? And the angel is so passive, right? Because it's the, it doesn't care. It's like, you broke God's law, you know, get out. And before this, we don't see these raw emotions of figures. We see holy figures were, were holy, right? They didn't have emotions. They were high on a higher plane than any of us. And so they didn't have these feelings. And so this is from a German um, illuminated manuscript, anonymous artist from the, the 1200s. And we see kind of the same thing, the angel with his sword kicking Adam and Eve out of heaven. And they look bummed, but like they're not super sad. They're like, okay, whatever, we'll find a new place to live. And that contrast is so different. Just a couple of hundred years apart, where finally these humanist ideas of showing art and emotion for people to, to feel along with the figures in the painting. This, this was a revolutionary idea. Masaccio gets skipped over in so many art history texts. You know, they're like, oh, vanishing point, that's it. But he just, he could paint emotion and, and portray this. And this is something that we see in the ancient Greek. If you think back to the Laocoon I showed a few minutes ago, he's, he's in anguish. And that kind of became the prototype for editing. Now we don't know it existed, but it's that idea that comes up. Of, you know, we can show people being sad. It's okay. It's actually probably better because then they don't feel like they can't. We're going to move on to my friend Donatello. This is where we start seeing, I call these the Ninja Turtle artists. Um, my students at, at DigiPen really like that. They're like, oh, have you seen the movie? I'm like, no, I haven't. I'm, I've got like three jobs, but I'll, I'll keep it in mind. So Donatello is the earliest of the Ninja Turtle artists. Again, these people all have the longest names and they just end up with one name like Cher or Prince. So it makes this easy. He didn't die of the plague. Way to go, Donatello. Good for him. He had a very long career. He just wasn't great at it. He he needed an accountant. 
We have some records where actually a lot of records where he didn't pay his taxes um, and he didn't finish commission, but he took people's money. So he wasn't a great person in the business sense, but he was really good at art. So I, I don't know. Take with that what you will. So Donatello sculpted this. This is the David, um, David of Goliath, king of Israel. It was commissioned by his buddies, the Medici family. They saw Donatello's work and um, as the wealthiest ruling family in Florence, they, they wanted him on their payroll. So this was sculpted um, for his, for their gardens. It's actually, they have a replica out in the garden of the palace today, the real ones inside of the museum. Obviously it's much safer. Uh, he sculpted this around 1440. And what makes this so exciting for art is it's the first freestanding male bronze nude, say that five times fast, mm -hmm. uh, since antiquity. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time in over a thousand years that we have a bronze sculpture of a nude figure. And that's partially because bronze is super expensive, right? Bronze is a metal. Metal is expensive, plus it can be used for other things like weapons. So we see in the tumultuous times of the Middle Ages, bronze being prioritized for, for weaponry and for coinage versus for art. But the Medici were super rich. Think like Elon Musk, J Jeff Bezos, rich of uh, the Renaissance court. So they had the extra coinage to spend on art. Florence sees itself as David because Rome, right, it's the Goliath. It is the major player in the Italian peninsula. And Florence is starting to come up, right? They've got the middle class, they've got a lot of trade. So they're starting to encroach on Rome's territory. So they see themselves as David. Actually, Michelangelo's David was purposely positioned facing the direction of Rome as like a big challenge. Uh, sadly though, for them, Michelangelo went to Rome and worked for the Pope. So I don't know who won in that case. But this David sculpture was kind of that first initial idea of Florence as Rome. It was cast what we use, uh, we call the lost wax technique. It's not lost as we don't know how it works. It's as it's the wax melts away. So it's it's lost. And this was a technique that had um, been fallen out of use. Like people knew about it, but because bronze was so expensive, they didn't have a way to, to do it. Um, it also showcases what we call contrapposto. And that means counterpose in English. And it's that extreme shifting of the hips. Now, this can vary from just a natural shift. Think of if you're standing up, you're not going to stand and lock your arms at your side and have your hips straight up and down. You're going to lean your weight onto one side of your hip, right? Because it's more comfortable for your body. It's a very relaxed pose. And you know, some people do it left, some people do it right. But it's the way that people's bodies just fall into place when you're, you're standing up talking to someone. This is a very extreme version of that where his hip is significantly popped to one side again, something we find in Greek and Roman art that was starting to be discovered more and more around the Italian peninsula. There's... <laughs> there has been a lot of commentary on the femininity of this David. I don't know. I, I don't lean one way or another. I think this is just Donatello showing off um, that he could do contrapposto with bronze. That's kind of how I feel because there's really no record one way or another. But yes, that is something during people are like, wow, he's so like effeminate, especially when you see later David, like Michelangelo or Bernini, where they're very masculine. Um, I've seen it in person. It's just as effeminate looking in person. This is this is definitely true to form, but it's not my favorite David. Um, it's a little less than life size because uh, bronze is really heavy and they wanted it up on a pedestal, but it's probably four and a half, five feet tall. So small life size. Like on Lisa, life size, I'm five two, so. And again, this is an extreme contrast to what we see in medieval art. Now, there's not a lot of medieval David statues around um, with images on the internet. So this is just a French dude, French king from a church. Um, but this is how a lot of statues looked. They were very linear um, because most of the time they were engaged in the columns. So they were just built as a part of the column. Uh, because primarily churches were where we get a lot of our decoration from medieval sculpture. And they were very flat, right? He's got a little bit of three-dimensionality because his arms are sticking out, but otherwise you could just see him pressed up against the wall and walking right by him. So there's no extreme contrapposto. There's no attitude. There, there's no narrative. They're just there. And I, so I get, this is why I get this a little bit of the dark ages. It's just different. It's not worse. It's just different. I feel like I really have to defend medieval art as a medievalist. It's like 15 years of it, you know, you just learn to, to defend it. 
So now we're moving on to the high Renaissance. Um, this is the Renaissance we call the famous one. So one you think of, everybody hears Botticelli, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, those the, the big ones of the Renaissance. And there's actually a pretty hard cutoff date, which we don't see in history. Usually it's like an approximation. But in 1527, this dude named Charles V, he ruled over basically all of Europe. On one side of his family, he had Isabella and Ferdinand, the monarchs of Europe, or of Spain, excuse me, where his grandparents left him the whole Spanish empire, including the Americas. On the other side of his family, on his father's side, Philip the Handsome, he definitely came out ahead on the epitaph. His family were the Holy Roman Emperors, so they ruled parts of France, Germany, the Netherlands, and parts of northern Italy. And he was the heir to both of those empires. So when he came of age, um, because his uh, mother had died, he got all of that as like a 16-year-old. Well, he wanted Italy too. So he sent his troops to Rome and they decimated it. We call it the sack of Rome. They actually captured the Pope and held him for ransom, which I don't think is going to get you a lot of good karma up in heaven, but you know, that is what it is. And we have graffiti actually of his soldiers writing on ancient buildings of being like so-and-so troop of Charles V was here. It, it's insane. And so art and culture just took a deep dive after this and took a little while to get built back up. So that's kind of why we have that hard line of the end of the High Renaissance. Botticelli uh, is the first artist that we see really in the High Renaissance style. We see them moving towards a lighter, more ethereal mythology based, right? So we're moving a little bit away from that pure humanity, but to the celebration of the ancient past. His name means little bottle. He just used a lot of paint, so they called him little bottle. I, I, don't, I don't really get it, but it stuck. Um, the, the Medici loved him. So we have most of his work is in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence today. I don't know why every time the slide loads, the picture doesn't look good on Zoom, but it looks great when it's just on the computer. So I apologize. But this is the birth of Venus. Everybody's seen it. It's been copied and parodied and memed so many times. My favorite is there's a fat orange cat on the shelf. That's my favorite. Like, it his belly up. That's my favorite one. But it just this is a famous composition. And so this was commissioned by the Medici family, we believe, for um, someone's marriage. It's a part of a trio showing Venus and her life. And as the goddess of love, it would make sense that she is shown for a marriage trio. Um, this painting was so revolutionary because of its attention to detail. So you have the little waves in the water the plant life along the sides and on um, Primavera, the Scottish Spring is flowing to put the cloak on Venus. There are historians with a microscope and a lot of time on their hands that went through and identified all the plants on her dress. And there are actually plants that are native to Florence that would have been blooming in the spring. We have, if you look very closely, you can see Zephyr, the, the naked guy flying in. He's the god of the west wind. And you can see his breath very lightly blowing Venus on her show towards the land from the sea. The attention to detail, like, it's so remarkable. I actually got to spend like 10 minutes alone with this painting in the UPC because I was, a, I made sure I was the first person in the museum that day. Every little brushstroke you can see if you get close enough. And he went through meticulously blending those colors to make sure that it appeared as lifelike and as vibrant as possible. And, and bringing this beauty to the story of Greek mythology to a more, you know, quote unquote, modern artist, uh, time period was a huge deal and so I can see why the Medici just went crazy for him because he was able to bring those stories that they just kind of heard for the first time over the last hundred years to life. Everybody knows Leonardo da Vinci. I mean we all read the Da Vinci Code at one point. He was a weird dude but I absolutely love him. He was the original Renaissance man because he studied art, sculpture, um, math, science. He invented flying machines, war machines. Um, he designed some dams in Milan. He did a little bit of everything. Now, was he a great person? No, he liked the reason the Mona Lisa is in France is because he never gave it to the dude that he was painting it for, even after Mona Lisa died in childbirth and he wanted to remember his life. He's like, nah, I like this too much. You can't have it. Um, but he, he really was ahead of his time and just exploring what it meant to have this crazy mind coming up with all of these ideas. And he was really a humanist because he didn't want to limit himself or his abilities. Uh, he made a huge impact on the history of art. I had to talk about it. I know it's famous and cliche, but I had to talk about it. It's the Mona Lisa. She is smaller than you think. She's only about 
size of like a legal piece of paper plus some. Um, it's not disappointing if you know that ahead of time. What is disappointing is the amount of lines to get through to see her. But if you turn around, you're facing the Mona Lisa and you actually flip around, ironically, the largest painting of those collection is behind you. It's called The Wedding at Cana by Paolo Veronese. What makes her so special? She's just a person. She's not a king or queen or saint. She's Mona Lisa. She was the wife of a wool merchant. I cannot say those words together. Wool merchant. She was the wife of that's going to be by kryptonite right there, speaking to the, the superhero theme of the room. Uh, wool merchant. And he had gotten really wealthy. So he commissioned the best artist in Florence at the time to paint a portrait of his wife. There's something about it Da Vinci just connected to it and carried it with her until his death. And that's why it's in France, because he died at the court of Francis I. And our historians have tried for hundreds of years to, to figure out what makes her so special. And I think, in my opinion, what makes her special is she isn't special. She's just a really nice portrait of an average person done with techniques that make her appear extraordinary. That little half smile she's so famous for. Is she smiling? Is she frowning? She's neutral. She just has a resting face. And yet... It, it makes her seem more human, right? She's not cheesily posing for a picture, you know, or making the, you know, the, the millennial duck face. She's just existing. The, the light haze that uh, Leonardo paints over it, the sfumato is what it's called. It's basically a very light layer of, uh, we call it varnish today, that gives the, the hazy filtered effect. It softens her and makes her seem, you know, like she's, she's just a regular person. The background imagery, again, is beautiful. It could be a place in Florence. It could just be something that Leonardo came up with. It's just a nice background. But by making her seem extraordinary as just a regular middle-class woman is something that I think we can all connect to. And that's such a humanist idea that still resonates with us. And I, I find that just really cool that like she's become the most famous painting in the world. I mean, Beyonce and Jay-Z shut down the Louvre to put her in a music video. Like You can't get more famous than that. Um, there's also a really cool picture, if you like history, of JFK and Jackie O standing in front of her because she got to come to America for a very short show during his presidency. Um, so it's kind of, it's like a weird mind twist of like, you know, famous 20th century people, famous Renaissance lady. Raphael, he's fine. I think he's a little overrated. He's really good at painting. I will give him that. But it's not as like breathtaking to me as Botticelli or Michelangelo or Leonardo. He died on his birthday. That's a bummer. Um, he, he went on a crazy like party through Rome the night before his birthday and then he died the next day. So that was a big, big bummer. But he is one of the few artists we see based in Rome during the Renaissance. The Pope was obsessed with him. They were best friends. Um, he's actually buried in the most important ancient church, the Pantheon. Uh, and he, he was kind of the golden boy of the Renaissance, right? Everybody wanted to be him. Everybody wanted to be with him. They wanted to work by Raphael. He painted a whole bunch in his short life. But it's fine. The best one, though, is the School of Athens. Now, this is, I love teaching this painting because it is essentially, if you bought every great pagan thinker in the room at one time, that's what this painting is. But it's in what was the Pope's bedroom. Should the Pope have had a lot of pagans in the bedroom wall? I'm going to go with no, but this Pope, Julius II, was not a great man. Like, he should not have been Pope on a spiritual level, but he was pretty cool. Like, in general, just not in a Catholic way. Um, so essentially what this work is, is Raphael painted all of the great ancient thinkers, some of which were known for, for a long time, like Plato and Aristotle, who are the two guys in the center, and some which were just rediscovered with this influx of knowledge from the East, like um, Euclid and Bramante, uh, excuse me, not Bramante, uh, I forgot his name, but it starts with a B. In an ancient Roman temple, you can see he took that idea of a vanishing point from Masaccio. You can see the ancient Roman building going back into space to make the bedroom look larger. Um, but yeah, it's like every great inspirational thinker from before the time of Christ is on this wall. Fun fact, he painted his fellow uh, Renaissance artist in it. So Plato, who's in the center pointing up, that's Leonardo da Vinci. The grumpy guy in the front, just like leaning like this. That's Michelangelo because he's uh, he's Euclid, the, ge the geometry, the guy who basically invented geometry, aka the bane of my existence in middle school. Um, and it's because Michelangelo was doing the architecture for St. Peter's at this time. 
And so Raphael painted himself as in the very far right-hand corner next to the column. He painted um, one of the kings, I can't remember which one, is Alexander the Great. A little, like a little toned down, like a, a little bit of brown nosing there. But he painted people in real life as, as pagans. And that was like, does anybody else but the Pope was the ruler? He would have been like, oh, buddy, you're going to get like executed. But the Pope, so it was fine. Um, again, you can see he's very talented. Like I'm not trying to like bash on him too much. I just think it's not as good. Like it doesn't have as much emotion. It's very stoic compared to other art. And I like art that I can feel. That makes me feel some kind of emotion, some kind of spiritual connection to the piece. Michelangelo, it is his real name. It is not a nickname. It's just his first name. Uh, he spans the gap between the high Renaissance and the late Renaissance. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of putting him in the middle there um, because he had such a long career. Now, he first and foremost considered himself a sculptor. He hated painting, which is hilarious because he did the whole Sistine Chapel and it's beautiful and very well done, but he was like not happy about it. Um, you know, he got paid a ton, so I don't know if he complained too much. But he considered himself a sculptor, just like our friend Botticelli and Donatello. He was discovered um, by the Medici family, so he spent his early years there. If you actually look at this portrait painted by one of his friends, his nose is crooked. He got in a fight with another painter and it like broke his nose. There's like a whole story about them getting arrested for assault, um, like like police records that have survived to this day. And that's why he's shown as like really grumpy all the time because he just had a bad attitude. But he was a great, great artist. So I guess we can excuse that. This was the first work that he did. He was very young. He was in his early 20s. It's called the Pieta. He actually sculpted it for the papacy um, in Rome. So this is his first major commission outside of Florence. This is the piece of work, of artwork, that made me want to be an art historian. I was 15. I saw it in Mr. Talley's AP Art History class at Lake Stevens High School. And this is the work I saw that said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And here I am. Um, so this is the Virgin Mary who is holding this, the body of Christ after the crucifixion of her son. And to me, what makes this so mind-blowing is this was a piece of rock. How? Like, how did he get it to be so perfect, right? He was so well-versed in, in all of the techniques it took to create three dimensions. I mean, look at Christ's body. It's so languid, right? It's, he's dead, but he's beautiful, right? He's not, he's not a gross dead body. He's not like CSI crucifixion. He's like, he's just draped gently over. And, and it's, it's so sad and it's so peaceful at the same time. And Mary is sculpted as a very young woman. Um, and this was to show her spiritually, right? She wasn't actually young, but she was spiritually young and beautiful. And you can feel her pain underneath uh, of the sad smile. Like she's holding the body of her son. Whether or not he was the son of God doesn't matter in this moment. It was her child and he's gone. And so just that, that he almost feels that these figures, she's going to stand up any minute to go carry him to the tomb. And the, the rich folds and, and the deep three-dimensionality, it's just so remarkable. Unfortunately, you can't see it very well today. It's under like a ton of bulletproof glass because in the 70s, some man attacked it with a hammer and broke her nose off. Um, don't worry, it's it's fine. Like they have the Vatican is some of the best art stores in the, in the world. They put the nose back on and you can barely tell unless you're like right up against it. Um, but it's behind a lot of glass. So it's very hard to see to this day. So it is beautiful though. Like I, I've seen it a few times when I was, was in Italy for studying abroad and I would like cry every time because it's just so crazy that, oh, he touched this. I'm looking at him. I get very emotional with art. You can ask my boyfriend. I've cried watching art on TV before. Um, so Michelangelo, like I said, kind of bridges that gap between the late Renaissance and the high Renaissance. So this kind of starts in other areas of Rome, of outside of Rome, excuse me, and then moves until we get to the Baroque period. We're going to talk about Michelangelo again, Titian and Parmigiano. I call him Parmesan because when you're teaching this and you're like trying to get your information in an hour, I, I stumble over the name. What we see characterized specifically during Bannerist period is what we call the S curve. And for some reason, we don't really know why. Any human body that was shaped like the letter S, artists went crazy for. They just thought it was the peak of culture and the peak of composition. So we're going to see that pop up a lot in art. We're going to have a continuation of mythology and humanism, um, but we're starting to show emotion 
and, and other things in the extreme. And you'll see this um, if you come to the next lecture next month on Baroque, you'll see how this transitions into the Baroque period. So since I said Michelangelo was a sculptor, I'm not gonna show the Sistine Chapel. I'm trying to be respectful. Man said he was a sculptor, I'll show you a sculpture. This is the Medici Madonna. So this is sculpted later in his life for the Medici family. You can actually see it's unfinished at the bottom. He got bored uh, towards the end of his life and he moved to project to project. So her legs and the base aren't quite finished. But if you look, this is very different than the Pietà. Here we have this serene, a uh, peaceful moment, even though it's, you know, a very sad moment, it's very peaceful. And here, it's almost like it could be any mother and child. I mean, how many squirming toddlers has, you know, they don't want to sit still. I remember when my little sister was a toddler, she just ran around like a, like a terror sometimes. That's what baby Jesus is doing. He's right here, he's a human baby. He's not the son of God. He's a baby who doesn't want to sit on his mom's lap anymore. And Mary is frustrated, right? She's holding him, trying to like, sit your butt down trying to hold him together, and yet it's, it's a little bit chaotic. And the, we have that S-curve composition. So we see that, that Michelangelo is showing more of the human side of, of these divine figures. And I think it's just really funny. Like I just like when babies actually look like babies in art. If you looked at any medieval art, Jesus looks like a 40-year-old man when he's supposed to be a baby. Um, so the fact that we're getting an infant is, is pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, Michelangelo. He did a lot more painting and architecture in his later life. And so sculpture from this period is a little bit more rare. Another famous one from this time period is of Moses. Uh, there was a mistranslation of the Bible for hundreds of years that instead of rays of light coming from Moses' head coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he had horns. So Michael Andrews Moses <laughs> little horns coming out of his hair. It's pretty funny. I, I love Titian, for me, is kind of like Masaccio. He is so underrated in the history of the Renaissance. Uh, and that's because he primarily worked and lived in Venice. And Venice, if you look at the boot of Italy, it's like at the top corner of the boot. So it's not really in the center of the activity. Uh, and in Venice, there's much more emphasis on color. Whereas in Rome and Florence, it's on design. So you'll often see, if you look at books about the Renaissance, the disegno versus colore. And that just means design versus color. And it was these two camps of artists who were just debating on whether or not, like, what was better. So Titian definitely was in the color camp, but he knew how to design. Though. Like, this wasn't him ignoring design and composition. He just, he liked color a lot. And he traveled away from Venice for a while, lived in Spain, came home to Venice. So he has a very rich artistic uh, catalog. This is one of my favorites. It actually came to Seattle in 2019, and I uh, almost peed my pants with excitement because we don't have any Titians in Seattle, so it was it was pretty exciting. It's called Danae, and it is a Greek myth. Uh, basically, Zeus has a lot of kids that are not with his wife, and this is one of those stories. And basically, Danae was locked in a tower by her father because there was a, a prophecy that any children of hers would usurp his throne. And he was like, but if I lock her in a tower, she can't have kids. No, that just meant Zeus was going to come in as a rain cloud. And yeah, she got a kid. I, I'll leave that to your interpretation. She got pregnant. And so this is the moment Zeus visiting her. And what makes this so famous for um, our historians is the reclining female nude. We don't have a lot of nudity in the Middle Ages. I really can't think of much other than the occasional Adam and Eve or Christ on the cross where he's just wearing the small loincloth. But otherwise anyone really was shown clothed. Then we move into the early Renaissance and we just see sculptures of men in the nude or paintings of men in the nude, unless it's out of me. So the fact that by now the mid 1500s, we have a full reclining female nude that was mind boggling. I guess it probably would have gone viral if that was a thing just because it was so different for artist to do at the time and the fact that she wasn't any kind of holy figure where that would work into her story somehow like eve made it even more and so we're seeing titian exploring the myth he actually has a whole series of these paintings that are spread across the world now um showing zeus's what they call it zeus's paramours um in different scenarios from mythology and so the fact that he's exploring this and the idea of female sexuality and of mythology it's just this huge new idea that the artists are going to carry forward for many, many centuries. Uh, this was one of the works that inspired Manning um, and his Olympia painting much later down in the Impressionist period. And finally, we have Parmigiano. He had a very, very long name as well. 
this was just a nickname. Everybody has a nickname. He, this is a self-portrait as if he's painted himself inside of a mirror, very Alice in Wonderland. This was all the rage back then. We have a lot of artists doing that. I just think it's fun. Um, he also died of the plague, bummer. Uh, so he had a very short career, but he did some cool things, including this weird Madonna and child. And this is my favorite painting from the Mannerist period. It's called Madonna of the Long Neck. I'm sure you can guess why. She's a freakishly long neck, but what's more freaky is Jesus. Like that kid is like, you should sign him up feeling like the Lakers or something. We can like recruit him now as an infant because he's going to be 12 feet tall, probably. Um, and this is just that weird mannerism period that's coming out. Mannerism is about pushing boundaries, right? We're, we're pushing the boundaries with female nudity. We're pushing the boundaries with composition. And now we're going to uh, push the boundaries with a female form. We actually have like somebody use the computer program, some art historian, to basically stretch out the Madonna and see how tall she actually is because she's sitting on a stool. And it looks just as weird as you think it would. Um, and Parmigiano is just pushing those ideas of what a proper composition could be, right? You're thinking back to other images of Madonna and child that we've gone through and everybody is very prim and proper, you know, Mary and Jesus. But here it like makes you think about it for a second. And some have interpreted this as, well, they're divine. They don't have to look normal, right? They can look weird. I tend to interpret it as he was just experimenting and figured, what the heck? I can do what I want. I'm an artist. And he did this. Uh, it's really fun. I, I adore it. I love showing it to people because they're always like, what the heck is going on? Because it's not as famous as like Raphael's Madonna's. And so I, I think it's a fun little exercise in, in understanding what it meant to, to paint divine figures. That is a wrap on the Italian Renaissance. It's it's much more in depth and, and weird than I think people realize because we mostly just focus on like Leonardo da Vinci or the birth of Venus. But in fact, it was a lot of pushing boundaries, not only of art, but of philosophy and what it meant to be human. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little something. And thank you so much for coming to the talk today. <laughs>
one of my students wrote their decked out mosaics, not exactly an art history term, but accurate, where there's wall, floor to ceiling coverings of imagery from the church. And so you see the split of, of ideas, what Christian art is even supposed to be. And then when we get to the Baroque period, which will be my next talk, we see the Catholic church just double down on imagery from the Bible. Um, as a way to bring people back into the faith. It was, it was a huge crisis. Wars were fought over it. There were massacres in France between the Protestants and the, and the Catholics. And so it, it, art is a capitalist. And I think that's true even today with, with the contemporary movements. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? How big is oh? How big is the Pieta? She's about nine feet across, eight to nine feet across, and probably about six feet tall. She's pretty big. Yeah, and it's a piece, one piece of marble that was quarried. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, his his David is about uh, 15, 16 feet tall. It's really crazy. You can see people. There's um, when they did the last cleaning, they hired a, a professional photographer to photograph the restores. And she's working on his head and she looks like this big compared to his head. It's, it's trippy. And they like built bricks around it in World War II because um, it was too heavy to move. But they were worried about it being bombed by, you know, either the Nazis or the Allies. So they built like a beehive shaped brick structure to hold it together and it worked. Mm -hmm. There's pictures of that too. And anything on the internet. 